Councilwoman Tara Mosley. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us today. I'm going to do just a brief couple of comments of introduction here for you, okay. and then just going to turn to you and ask you why you, why now? So you can get okay. ready for that answer, which you've done probably 27 times in the last <laughs> week alone uh, in Give our or community. Take. <laughs> which is good, right? We need to hear from people and have conversations. So um, for those of you who don't know her, Tara Mosley is current city councilwoman serving the people of Akron's fifth ward since 2013 and serves on six committees, including public services, public safety, Parks and Recreation, Public Utilities, Housing and Neighborhood Assistance, Planning and Economic Development. She attended the University of Akron, majoring in Political Science and Public Policy Management, then transferred to the Academy of Court Reporting, studying paralegal studies with a minor in Business Administration. Her past professional employment includes the United States Postal Service, Akron Municipal Court Bailiff, White Hat Management, Paralegal and Board Liaison, and Parms Law Firm Office Manager. Her civic memberships and affiliations include Secretary Treasurer for the Northeast Ohio Joint Medical District Board of Directors, the National League of Cities Board of Directors, NBC LEO, Public Safety and Crime Prevention Steering Committee. Uh, she was elected to the Ohio delegation in 2012 and uh, 2016, the Ohio Democratic Party member, she's a Sierra Club member, Emily's List member, and past National Paralegal Association member and previously served on the NEFCO board. Her bio and, and detailed information are available on her website, which we've linked to and also have provided folks in advance. She has five adult children, 12 grandchildren, and a dog, Langston. So we'll do that. <laughs> uh, Councilwoman Mosley, thanks again for being with us today. So why don't we just start out with you giving us a few thoughts about why you, why now for the city of Akron? Well, first, thank you for having me. I appreciate you all taking the time this afternoon um, to uh, listen to each and every one of us who believe that we could lead the city in our own uh, perspective ways. Um, during my three terms on Akron City Council, I have learned that there is a segment of our community that has felt forgotten for quite some time. Um, I have a unique ward. My ward has, funny story, it looks like an upside down drunk bunny is what I tell everyone. <laughs> It okay, starts sure it starts in North Hill and we they've even expanded the ward even further mm -hmm. into North Hill. I'm like three blocks from being in the Calca Falls. And I come down uh, North Howard Street, I cut through downtown Akron, past Stark State, mm -hmm. which is in Ward Five, Suma, which is in Ward Five, all the way through Middlebury uh, Plaza, then I cut all the way up Arlington Street. Mm -hmm. So it, you guys are driving with me in your head, right? This is this is Ward Five. I go all the way to Waterloo Road. But then I have a portion of South Akron uh, from DPO's, Kleins, mm -hmm. all that footprint over there is all in Ward 5. So when I say I have a, un a very unique ward, my ward touches every part of the city except for West Akron, okay. every single part of it. And so because of the three terms that I've, that I've uh, been uh, the representative for the residents of Ward 5, um, I've been able to have a very unique relationship with those residents because I have a very diverse uh, footprint mm -hmm. but the one thing seems to be consistent there is no relationship or, or there is a disconnect between these neighborhoods in downtown so what I've done over my tenure is trying to rebuild that relationship or build that relationship that may have not ever been there um, and then I really just had to talk to my residents I talked to them because for them having a representative who really was very vocal for them and made sure that I brought that economic development into the ward. I, I, I'm very proud of the work I've been able to do with Stark State Akron and the work I've been able to do with SUMA and the work I've been able to do with Tony Trophy. That footprint alone um, in that north side district, we have been able collectively to bring over $1.2 billion into the ward mm -hmm. that they have never seen. And that be, that's because of relationships, the relationships that I've been able to build um, with SUMA, um, with Stark State Akron, with um, Tony Trophy, um, and then some. And so as I thought about it, for clarity, I've always wanted to be the mayor of the city of Akron. So I want to make sure I put that on the table. I don't want anybody to just think I woke up one day and said, hey, I want to be the mayor. It has always been my desire to be the mayor of the city one day. Um, I have a good relationship with Mayor Horrigan. Um, and so I actually encouraged him to run again. Mm -hmm. I, I told him these are a couple things I would do if I were you and I think you'll be okay. But I think a lot of things had transpired over his, his last term and it just was a lot. And it's a lot when you have a family and when you have grandchildren, you just start thinking about things in a totally different way. And so um, 
talking to, to him and then talking with my residents and, and then reassuring them that I'm not going anywhere. I do believe the work that I've done in Ward 5, I could expand it across the city. And I think it was much needed to have that conversation with them so they would understand I was not abandoning the ward that I grew up in. And so keeping, keeping my promises to them is, is paramount. It's paramount because I am in this seat because of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, having that conversation with Mayor Horgan, he did call me before he, he talked to the press about he, he wasn't running. And he said, I, I owed you that. Mm -hmm. And I respect him for that. Because he didn't have to, but he did. And um, I had, you know, these relationships with people who were running in the November election, and I wanted to keep my word. I was helping them on their races. I didn't want to be a distraction. Mm -hmm. So I continued to help them. Although other people had started announcing that they were running, I just felt like we needed to make sure, first of all, that we got our congresswoman in that seat, mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that we had other candidates across the, the region that I was assisting. And so I kept my word, and after the election was over, then I announced. So some people got a head start on me, but it's okay because I seem to have caught up. In heels, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Saw that. You did the debate yesterday in heels the entire time. And so I am running because I do believe that uh, the vision that I have for, for the city, mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is night and day between my, the candidates in this race. It's because I have a lived experience that none of them have. Um, I am from a neighborhood that none of them have ever lived in. I still live in a neighborhood that many people won't even come to. Mm -hmm. um, and I know what's missing there because I live amongst them. My family lives amongst them. And I know that the work that we've been able to do there is work that we'll be able to do across the city in a very impactful and meaningful way. So we've had an opportunity to work together on some things over time related to the Elevate Greater Akron plan and yeah. the work that is um, that we think is important overall for the region and for the city. And you know, you've been in lots of forums where lots of different topics have been discussed. We want to talk a little bit more about economic development, yes. jobs, those kinds of things today. So, you know, one of the things that the Elevate Greater Akron um, report early on identified is that lack of shared prosperity in our community. The uh, economic exclusion that, that sort of has seemed to exist over time. And you talked very much about touching all different parts of the city. And for the people who are in your ward, the residents of our city who aren't experiencing sort of a lift in their economic situations, what are some of the parts of the Elevate Greater Akron plan that you'd really like to emphasize more or see us do more over the term, uh, your first term as mayor? Right. I, I think for me, and the work that I've done and the people I've spoken with, there seems to be, I don't want to say a disconnect, but there doesn't seem to be a real plan for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Our entrepreneurs feel like they, they've been left out of the equation. And even when I talk about, even with the city and the way we finance certain small businesses, there, there is no pathway in there for entrepreneurs or even a small business owner. If you don't have over three employees, on the payroll, you are excluded for, for, from a lot of these funds that they offer, but they'll offer you a loan. So why, why in the world would we offer an entrepreneur or mm -hmm. someone who is just starting out a loan instead of giving them a hand, a, a hand up, you know what I mean, just so they can be prosper, prosperous and they'll stay here in the city. And I, I think that we have to work better as a city with that. And I think if we really are intentional with the Elevate Akron plan, making sure that those entrepreneurs are given the resources to be successful. And a lot of people, sometimes they hear resources, the first thing they think is, oh, you just want to give them free stuff. No, mm -hmm. that's, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that a lot of these entrepreneurs and small business owners, they need someone to help them with a business plan. Mm -hmm. They need a business model. A lot of them don't even understand that. Some of them don't even understand that they need to go get an EIN number. Some think all you need is an EIN number yep. and open up a bank account. And, and they think they're off and running, but there's so many, so many steps before they even get there that a lot of them don't even know. And there's really, there's really no, there's nothing in place to help them with that. Instead of them trying to go to, I know they, you know, they had SCORE downtown that would help people sometime. Um, but a lot of times they're jumping online, mm -hmm. filling out paperwork, and then they think that's all they need to do. But then when they go to try to get assistance and you know, they're denied, then that's when the frustration kicks in. You know, so to see if Ele the Elevate Akron plan could 
be more intentional on making sure that segment of the community, because we have a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners in this city, and honestly, they will be the ones that drive this economy. Well, I want to clarify and make sure I understand, because you're talking really about those companies, and we saw a lot of them through COVID, to try to help, right, that had uh, maybe they're the only employee, they maybe didn't have two or three or four employees, it was them, maybe it was somebody in their family. So those much smaller companies right. that have very limited numbers of employees. And so more technical support and assistance for them is something that you'd like to see us Absolutely. do more of. Okay. Absolutely. Right. What are some of the kinds of things, um, as we've sort of looked at the ARPA funding that has sort of come into the city over the last year or so, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the $145 million that the city has spent um, and how that those dollars are prioritized. Where do you think some wins have been in that work? Where would you have done some things differently as mayor of the city? Well, I, I <laughs> okay, so let's start with, I think the council should have um, had more say of how the funds were spent. So mm -hmm. we have to start there. Yep. Um, I, I do appreciate the home repair grant and them setting money aside for that, but it, the, there was not enough funding set aside for the home repair grant. Okay. So when we talk about building population, uh, we have to talk about the, how, the housing that is already here in the city of Akron. And a lot of our residents who put in for the housing repair grant, my ward meeting alone had almost 100 people show up for, okay. for assistance. Um, by the deadline, almost 2,000 people had signed up mm -hmm. um, for these repairs. And you know, there was $25,000 per household up to. I, I think it, they should have probably made it $10,000 and they okay. could have served more people. Um, but a lot of those individuals who are in group A, they're now in group B. Some of them have been told they're gonna go into a lottery system and a lot of them are elders. Okay. So I, I think we, we should have uh, funded that, uh, that part of the city's um, ARPA initiative uh, better the gun violence prevention um, funding that they gave out, I think it was like a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these organizations are out here doing great work, but I, I think that it, it should have been more than just throwing money towards these organizations to say that we're combating gun violence. Because a lot of these organizations, I've never seen in my neighborhood. Okay. And so when we talk about, don't just say we're doing things, but there has to be a metric that has to be met. How is this positively um, benefiting those neighborhoods? Instead of just saying, well, we did give money to that, but what did the money do? You know, and so as you think about the way that the money was just, I mean, we'll never see this kind of money ever yeah, again. Right. And to just give it all away like that, without a metric being in place, it, to me it was problematic. But I think that if council would have had a say, um, in a voice, a lot of these uh, initiatives probably wouldn't have went forward or they would have went forward with more funding. So some of them needed more funding, definitely the housing repair grant. Um, I, I think we, we got some pushback on using some of the funding for flock cameras. Mm -hmm. But again, someone who lives in those neighborhoods that, are, uh, that has been negatively affected by, by violence um, I seen the reason for the flock cameras going in the community and I did have a couple of activists that were very upset with me voting on it, but I said, you guys don't live in my neighborhood. Right. I understood why they needed to be there. And so uh, there's some say that there may end up being a couple million dollars left at the end for the next administration. Uh, I do hope that if that's the case that we use it to help a lot of our small business owners because they need it, especially the ones in downtown. So, and so talk about that for a second, because you have lots of neighborhoods that you're connected to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do have a core downtown that sort of right. also we want to see investment and development in. Um, you mentioned the, earlier when we were talking, the Lock 3 groundbreaking today, that, that's an important asset for us. How do you think about a vision for our downtown and what our downtown is to the community? And, and what would you like to see us do more in terms of investment in downtown and in our neighborhoods? Well, I think the $20 million investment from the Knight Foundation to the Polsky building, uh, we have to build on that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we're, we're on our, this is our third time something that in downtown Akron is, is gonna shut downtown down. How does that affect those businesses down there? Most of those uh, businesses that run across the Main Street corridor, they benefit from Lock 3 activity, but there will be no Lock 3 activity because we're getting ready to do our 
Envy Theater, uh, theater Remodeling. Uh, one of the businesses I just spoke with today, Unknown, they're new to downtown. Mm -hmm. And they said, what are they doing across the street? And I said, it's the Lock 3 groundbreaking. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, Lock 3 is not going to be there this summer. And these were the workers in there, and I could see the panic come over their face. <sighs> and, uh, and they said, well, where are everybody going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, well, they're going to have different venues through other parts of downtown, but that that walkability in that footprint right there, rather from from unknown to to the peanut shop mm -hmm. to Baxter's to Lockview, like they really benefit from that foot traffic. So what does that look like for them? There has to be a plan in place for them. There has to be a plan in place for those businesses inside the Malone building. I used to work in the Malone building with Attorney Parms. So when things in, in, in that footprint change, it affects everyone there. And we've had COVID affected. We had the big dig affected. Mm -hmm. Now we're about to have lock three affected. So we need to make sure that there are resources in place to make sure that those individuals can, can sustain during this time. Yet again, simple things. One of the businesses says they have to keep coming outside and putting money in the parking meter while they're working there. And they said, I'm, I'm working to pay parking so I can park in the front because they can't afford to park in the parking deck. Those are little metrics that we as a city can meet to make sure that those businesses um, are able to be sustainable in that footprint, not just in that small print, all the way down to Market Street. Um, you have to pay the toll, pay the toll mm -hmm. um, to park there. So we, as a city, we need to think about how do we help them. Just little small things like that could help them. Um, the parking deck. I didn't even realize that the the cost of parking in a parking deck had went up so much for them. And it may seem like something that's small for us in this room, but for them, I mean, that's 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 big. When, especially if you got four or five employees working there and you're paying these monthly fees for each person, um, that could be uh, either I'm gonna keep four employees or I do have to now go down to two because now lock three is gonna be closed where's the benefit for them so mm -hmm. um, I think building around what the Polsky building is going to do with the funding from uh, the Knight Foundation one thing that I do know is that there has to be some kind of grocery store in that footprint mm -hmm. you have businesses down there uh, downtown has a lot of residential apartments in downtown Akron now and it probably will be even more to fill some of this space up but we have our students there as well. Mm -hmm. And the closest grocery store they have is Dave's. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those students don't have cars. So they're jumping on the bus to go to Dave's to do their shopping, but then they have to wait to get back on the bus. And it's, it's very easy to get off the bus and go on to Dave's and get back on and come back. But what about those students who, you know, maybe they have more than just one bag of groceries. Right. So we have to figure that part out. Um, it's easy for them to get on the bus and get there. That's easy. We might have to figure out how we can do a loop around for those students mm -hmm. who have more than just one grocery bag. But to be able to put a grocery store in this footprint would be would be would be something that I would definitely support. So, so a little bit more amenities downtown. Um, in terms of, you think the other levers sort of sort of growing our downtown or growing uh, our our jobs in Akron? What are, what are some of the other levers that you want to see us really focusing on for our community? In downtown or in our more or broadly, right? Population broadly, in Akron okay. is population in Akron. So, what right. are some things that can really help us start to see some growth? Right, growth starts in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We we have to rebuild our housing stock. Um, I know we always talk about building population, but you have to build it in a way that will make people want to stay here, mm -hmm. and build it in a way that we will want our children and our grandchildren to come back home after school, or even if they're here and they're working a the trade, you want to try to keep them home if you can. At least I try to. I have a daughter in Arizona. Every other day, I'm trying to get her to move back home. <laughs> and I've, I've not been successful, but I try as much as I can. And uh, I, that starts with making sure that we rebuild our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have uh, uh, residents who've lived in homes in these neighborhoods 20, 30, 40 plus years. Those are people who are dedicated to the city. Mm -hmm. They are dedicated. They're going to stay here. So if that means building those neighborhoods up so their housing stock can go up, that's what we need to do. I have empty lots all across Ward 5 we can build on. They're buildable lots. Mm -hmm. um, right now, Goodrich Junior High, we could sit here and talk all day about what's going on over at Goodrich. It's, it played out in the news media last week. 
I've been trying to get Goodrich torn down for the last two years, and they told me it's almost a million dollars to tear it down, but now it's become an eyesore to a community that has been in that neighborhood forever. My great-grandfather built a home on Baird Street oh, wow. that my grandparents lived in where my mom was born, and I lived there until I was five years old, and then we moved to another uh, section of East Akron. But that neighborhood over there is a neighborhood does, that does not plan on leaving but we need to build it up where their children and, and grandchildren may want to stay there too. So that whole footprint of where Goodrich, that actually could be a whole entire housing development. So when we're talking about building sustainable, affordable housing, I mean, that footprint there alone, we could build 40, 50 houses just right there on that acreage. So what's the barrier to sort of being able to do that? What do you think has to change and what would you sort of prioritize as mayor to allow for more development of those units for more people to sort of want and desire to be there? Well, we, we definitely have to do something with our zoning laws, for mm -hmm. sure. Zoning, we, as someone who sits on planning, some of the things that come to zoning, I, I, I just don't understand why they're in front of us. It just, some of them just don't make any sense. Right now, we bring daycares in front of us for zoning. And, but their funding comes from the state, and it's like they could be a type A daycare, but they want to move to a type B. Now it has to come to city council because they're gonna service maybe five or six more children through zoning. It just, some things in zoning, we definitely have to change the metric of how zoning has worked in this city. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking about just going on a crazy build in residential areas and putting office buildings in residential areas, but there, we have to get rid of a lot of the red tape as it relates to zoning. And I think that will help a lot. And, and, and making it palatable to developers to want to build in those neighborhoods. We, we can't just, say the best place to build is out the White Pond. Right. There's other places in the city that you could actually build affordable housing and people will buy there. They will buy single family housing. I think a lot of times when people hear affordable housing, the first thing they think is low income housing. Mm -hmm. Here comes another AMHA project, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about single family housing. And, and there is a desire to buy single family housing affordable. I mean, you could build $200,000 homes all day, but um, there, that's only a certain segment that you're going to cater to. My understanding is that definition is sort of 30% of income on a monthly basis sort of for housing. Is that yeah. sort of the threshold yep. that yes. affordable housing sort of is? Okay. So it's, yep. it's, it's a range of different housing options for people. Right. Absolutely. Even tiny houses. I'm yeah. a fan of tiny houses. I yeah. I visited uh, L.A. and looked at their their tiny house de development and it's beautiful we just have have to figure out how do we make that work in a community where we have four seasons uh, it is interesting when you talk about that there are so many different opportunities i've seen container housing oh, yes. developments i've seen lots of different things you wouldn't think of in the right. same way as a house but are very functional and pretty cool for Absolutely. for people and communities it makes yeah. communities look differently yeah. so one of the things that we talked about we talked about jobs a little bit we talked about development a little bit um, let's talk about workforce for a minute. You and I have done some work in the past on workforce initiatives to try to get people jobs, right? right. Try to connect with the opportunities that are out there. Right. Somebody told me today that there's 8,000 jobs in our community and we've got a lot of people who probably um, would love to be in those jobs. And the biggest factory for developing um, people for jobs is Akron Public Schools in our community, right? right. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of issues related to Akron Public Schools of late. Um, as mayor, how would you interact with um, get involved with the work that's happening to try to help prepare our youth, um, to try to help um, our kids be more ready to take the jobs that are available in our community. All right. So the academies that they're creating in our um, APS system, I, I love it because college is not for everyone. Right. It's just not. A lot of our, our, our kids, they just want to get out of school. That's it. And to just tell them, I need you to go to college now. A lot of our kids just don't want to do that. They're looking for a trade um, so they can just get on to work. Um, the, for example, one of our academies is our police and fire academy. They have it at Ellen. For me, I, I think that academy should be at more than just one school. Because when we start talking about we want to rebuild um, our police force and make it look more like the community, that academy should have not only just been at Ellen, it should have been over at Firestone and Bookdale as well. Because when we want to talk about defer diversifying our police force, Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen just being at one school. I mean, my kids graduated from Ellet, but it's a different makeup between Ellet and Firestone and Bookto. Right. And, and so in order to make a force look like the community, you need to be in more than one school. But that comes with um, relationships. 
and, and you have to be able to have relationships with people. You don't have to agree with them all the time. Um, I, I continue to say that, you know, what happened between the superintendent and the school board and how it played out um, in front of the community, it was unfortunate. Yep. I truly believe that you have to be able to be someone who could bring all of these individuals to a table. We're not all saying we got to be best friends and go to dinner together, but the common thread has to be Akron. It has to be this community. It has to be our children. And a lot of times when I hear the, the dialogue and the back and forth, the one thing everyone seems to forget about are the children. Yeah. And so making sure we, re we build those relationships where we know that these children come first, making sure these teachers have a safe environment to teach in, and making sure that the kids and the teachers have a safe environment to function in is important. Yeah. But that comes with making sure that the mayor, whomever she may be, <laughs> has a great relationship yep. with the superintendent as well as the school board as well as with the teachers union because they all have to work together in order for our schools to be able to produce good kids who can stay here at home and do the work of, that these academies are put there to do. So how can the city play a role in, in driving more youth employment in our community and driving more uh, opportunities for our kids to experience learning while working and earning in our community? Training. 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 Definitely, definitely training. When, when uh, I was in high school many, many moons ago, <laughs> many, many, many moons ago, uh, we had an OWE classes. Mm -hmm. um, it, I was at Central Howard. We had, uh, we had a business class. We had a cosmetology class. We had a graphic arts class. We had a carpentry class, but we had an OWE class. And those were for students who only were in school a half a day, and they went out into the workforce. So they, they had learned jobs. for part of the day, they went and worked and for part of the And they went and worked, yeah. Oh. And so even when, when we talk about making sure that uh, we have uh, a system that works for all of our students, they all learn differently. We're talking mm -hmm. about kids who you know, may be academics. They want to go to college. They want to do great things like that. But then we have a lot of our students who don't want to do that. They have no desire to do that. So there has to be a space where they can thrive as well. And I think doing it that way, you not only get a, a student who's going to be able to graduate, but they're going to be able to go right into the workforce as well, right mm -hmm. here at home. So as mayor, you get to decide sort of the team that you put on, on in place. You get to decide the kind of key roles in your cabinet and your administration. You've talked a little bit about small business. You've talked a little bit about economic development in different ways. How would you think about doing things differently as it relates to responsibility for economic development? Or, and I, I know you have to, a lot of work you'd have to do to figure that out, but are there big things you'd want to see different with the way in which your administration is sort of tasked with economic development? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to expand on well, that? Well, just, just, uh, just maybe at the broad bit. level, because you know that you, yeah. you'll learn a lot, right? As yeah. you go through the process, you're going to have a long month, months of transition, but what are some early ideas you have about doing that work maybe right. differently? First, you have to start with a, a strong transition team. Yep. And you have to have people from the business community at the table when doing that. Um, if you think you're the smartest person on your team, you're on the wrong team. <laughs> so I know to, to surround yep. myself with people who are brilliant in these areas so that we can sit down collectively and say, this is what I believe will help you move this city forward in the right direction and making sure that we follow it through. Um, a lot of people come up with great plans and somewhere along the plan, they just stop. Mm -hmm. But if we know it's going to actually move our community forward in a positive direction, why stop in the middle? Just push it out. Um, when I think about economic development in, in this city and uh, job creation, you have to make sure you have someone from the business community who really understand what that looks like and what mm -hmm. that means. Um, not just counting those who have the educational background in that, but you know sometimes that, that learned experience takes you a lot further. And I think it's really important that you have someone with that bandwidth of, of personal knowledge and experience at the table to push that forward. I'm going to pause for a second, open up the questions from folks in the room here. Things that you want to ask of Tara Mosley. Seriously, guys? Oh. Please. Uh, I got Ebony will start us off lady. here. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's not yeah. been shy today, so. Yeah. So the question is, what are the first 90 days in office look like for you? So the first 90 days for me looks like having meetings, real meetings, uh, more than just inviting someone to the table. 
It's about having real meetings with those individuals who you may have not had the greatest relationships with, having discussions with them about what we need to do to move this community forward, move this city forward. And that starts with making sure that there is a real intentional relationship between the county, mm -hmm. making sure there's a relationship there with our business stakeholders, making sure that there's a conversation and having um, our police at the table, mm -hmm. our FOP president at the table, because there's no way in the world you could talk about moving the city forward in 90 days and not having these relationships and conversations with people. It has to start with having meaningful conversations. It's more than just, hey, I'm having this meeting, stop by. No, let's all sit down collectively and talk about what your departments are doing and how we can work together. Because it makes no sense if, if the city is doing one thing and the county is doing another, where if they could work together, not only could they put their resources underneath one umbrella, they probably would save a lot more time, energy, and money if they just worked together. So convening a meeting with all of them is the first and foremost thing that has to happen, and that'll happen within before 90 days. That has to happen immediately. I mean, just picking up on that, though, um, this will be a very unique opportunity for um, the mayor-elect since unless something uh, we don't expect happens, there will be no one else contesting this right. race in right. November. The Democratic primary winner will be our mayor. How do you use that time differently? I mean, you're going to get seven months or so to sort of work through the process of thinking about what looks different. Uh, building a transition team behind the scenes is definitely something that has mm -hmm. to happen within that time. So you can really have them start to, to do the work before you even get to January. Yep. You already have a plan in place before you even get to January. But during that time, I will still be the Ward 5 representative, so right. I will continue to do the job that I've been elected to do and putting this transition team together so now they can come to me and say, this is what we see, mm -hmm. and this is what we've learned in these, in these six, seven months. And so it gives me a template to look at so now I can put the things that we have in our platform within that structure. And that structure only happens when you have a collective group working on it together. Okay. Other questions? Please. Um, I know you said you sat on six boards, right? Yes. Uh, and so um, you, you mentioned something pertaining to a lot of red tape issues in, in certain areas. So um, based off your experience of sitting on those boards, um, have you come up with ideas to address some of these red tape issues in order to streamline some of these processes that may be taking too long or you know, bring um, great ideas crashing to the ground because they're lost in translation. Right, right. So let me just repeat the question yes. for a taping, but I think um, the question is related to your experience um, that you have as city council person and working on all these different committees for the city. Do you have ideas about how to reduce the amount of red tape or um, difficulties that exist to sort of get things done, to invite in businesses to do the kinds of things that you want to do? Right. So the red tape for the city has definitely been an issue in a lot of our areas. Um, one of the areas where I, I realize there's a lot of red tape is when we talk about our housing and neighborhood development. Um, example, we'll have a resident who's been taking care of a lot and they want to purchase the lot. They come to the city and they want to purchase a lot and now here comes the red tape. The city wants to send out letters to everyone who may be adjacent to the property, giving them an opportunity to purchase a lot that this person over here has been taking care of the whole time. And then if there's uh, back taxes, now the city has to involve the land bank in it because now they have to bring, they got to do a foreclosure process. There has to be a way to streamline that process, especially when you have someone who's been taking care of the property the whole time. One of the things that we've been able to do as a city um, is we have these demo waivers. Um, and this was something I was able to work on with Jason Segedy. We had demo waivers um, as I used to chair housing. It's probably why I don't chair housing anymore because of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they would have the, the owner of the property would sign the demo waiver. And the city would tear the property down. It would be hundreds, sometimes $100,000, sometimes more than that. But then the city would give the property back to the person who signed the demo waiver. And I said, wait, wait a minute, what? So we just paid the tariff property down and we're gonna give them the property back? I said, that didn't make any sense. And I said, well, if they sign a waiver, they should waive the property as well. 
why in the world will we give it back to them? But because of us having that conversation, they there's only a certain amount of money that goes towards the waivers now. Um, but because of that, we have properties that people can build on now because of that. And so when we talk about the red tape, as I sit on the National League of Cities Board of Directors, um, I would love to see our function, our city function the way we function on that board because we have committees so we can say, okay, this goes here, this goes here, we're dealing with public safety, we're dealing with the environment. So it goes to those people and say, okay, how do we get from A to B faster than what we've been doing? And so something that normally would take three years, it should only take maybe six months. And we have to do a better job with the city doing that because we have a lot of houses that are still sitting. When I talk about our housing department, we have houses that are still sitting waiting to be torn down. I'm talking about been sitting there three, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about red tape, it exists within the Housing and Neighborhood Development Department. And again, if you look at our platform, it is one of the very first departments that we will revamp because of that. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So where is the city hurting the most and how as mayor can you address that pain point or those pain points? Public safety, definitely public safety. Um, and that's across the city. Um, a lot of people think that it's only certain neighborhoods that are being affected by crime and people being concerned about safety. That's going on across the whole entire city. Um, I co-chair public safety right now. So I've been very intentional about pushing certain pieces of legislation just to give our residents across the whole entire city some relief. Um, and one of those things was putting the dash cameras in the police cars. So when we talk about transparency and people talk about the police and um, putting those dash cameras in the cars was very important for the whole entire community. Um, we started with um, um, making it a resolution, calling for the legislation, they found the grant funding for it and now as of June all the vehicles will have um, uh, dash cameras in there but I've also requested them to give uh, ring cameras to our residents and so they're going to do a pilot program but one thing as mayor I, I want to get rid of these pilot programs we always come up with pilot programs for everything and then you never see it carry on from there mm -hmm. If, if you have residents who are willing to allow the city to tap into those cameras, if something in those neighborhoods happen, um, if giving the marine camera is gonna help curve a lot of the crime that we're seeing in our neighborhoods, especially with our elders who live alone, and they are the main ones who have been the driving force of the ring cameras with me. When I told them what I wanted to do, they said, well, will you give them to us too? Or is it gonna be income driven? It shouldn't have anything to do with driven, being uh, the, the, the catalyst for any of this. But I'm always going to say start with our elders. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who lived with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I just feel like we need to make sure that we protect our elders first, especially when they live alone. And if that means putting a ring camera on their house so they can feel safe, um, that, that to me is just a small, a small part. I thought we were going to set some money aside in our ARPA dollars. That did not happen. Um, they're going to do a pilot program and thank God for the University of Akron because they stepped in and they're putting money into that pilot program, but it's going to be in a university footprint. I requested that it go in certain red zones within our community that have been, uh, you know, the most affected by crime. Um, one of my residents who live on Ardella, a young man behind him was shot and killed in the apartments behind him. Well, the detectives went to his house and knocked on the door and they said, we want to look at your ring cameras. He panicked. He called me, it's like two o'clock in the morning. The police are here and they want to look at my ring cameras. Somebody got shot behind the house. He doesn't live that far from me. I said, just let him look at your cameras. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on now, let him look at the cameras. And so the detective got on the phone. He thanked me for staying on the phone the whole time while they looked at the cameras. They downloaded it and they sent it on to the police department. They ended up catching the person who, who shot the young man. But it's those little simple things right there that will really curve a lot of the crime that we are seeing in our neighborhoods and this is going on across the city. I have been very intentional about calling for substations which are district stations across Columbus has them, Cleveland has them, why can't Akron have them? We need to bring our police officers out of downtown Akron. They need to be in the neighborhoods building those relationships. If you build the relationships in the neighborhoods like we have with our police officers, 
funny story, whenever we seen cop car number five, we go, oh, here comes cop car number five. We knew he was coming to harass us, but the other ones, we were good. They were on their bikes, they got <laughs> off, they talked to us, but we knew cop car number five was coming to say, why y'all sitting on that wall? Go home. We knew it was coming. But when the officers like Officer Miles and Officer Ridgeway, like we knew them, they rode on their bikes through the neighborhood and we would see them wave. We don't have that anymore. And we have to get back to our officers being in the neighborhoods, building those relationships, doing parks and walks, doing cops on the porch with our elders, because then when we have issues in our neighborhoods, those young people won't be afraid to speak to the police. It all goes out the door because they know who that officer is. They don't mind having a conversation with them. So yes, public safety, first and foremost, has to be addressed quickly, like quickly, not 90 days, like soon as you get in office, it has to be addressed. Yes. You focus uh, very closely on the city of Akron and on the neighborhoods. Um, how do you see yourself positioning Akron in the larger <coughs> scope with the state, with um, looking at business opportunities that are outside of this, this region to draw in um, new opportunities? How do you see yourself as that uh, connector? Right. So first it has to start with you having a good relationship with our state legislators as well as with our congressperson. I, I've, I'm afforded to have great relationships with both of them, which is great. And when those opportunities come up, them being able to contact me and saying, hey, we have this opportunity, we have grants that are coming up, please make sure people apply for them. And so I send those um, in, into my community, especially right now, um, there was a congressional grant that was available um, and no one for the city of Akron even applied for it. Hmm. Hudson got some of it, Cargo Falls got some of it, no one from Akron applied because they didn't even know about it. They didn't even know about it. So making sure that you have that relationship there so you can attract people here. And also making sure that outside of just attracting from you know the Columbus area, we're talking about the migration. There's going to be a great migration from the Southwest because it is drying up. They don't have water. Ohio has water. So to be able to, to have those relationships and conversations with those people who live in the southwest parts of our country and saying, hey, we have the best resource that most people don't have, and it's called water. That's how you drive businesses here, that you have to make it palatable for them to come here. You got to make sure that they have the incentives to come here. I know a lot of times people hear that 15-year tax break, they get nervous, but we have to have some kind of incentives to, to draw them into our city, for sure. So the question was, how does our economy here in Akron benefit from having the resources of the broader region and in cities like Cleveland and others, but still sort of drive benefit here locally? Well, we have LeBron James, they don't. So we can start <laughs> there. <laughs> I, I think that the work that he has done alone drives people here. Um, I, I look at Akron and Cleveland as sister brother cities with one another and having that relationship there is going to be very important. Even when we think about, even when they had the Republican National Convention, I mean, people had to stay in Akron as well. Um, they didn't have enough uh, uh, bandwidth to handle that amount of people. And so having that relationship there with them is going to be paramount to this seat. Um, I, 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 I'm blessed to be friends with quite a few of the Cleveland City Council members. I actually serve on the National League of Cities with quite a few of them. So we talk about that a lot. We've actually traded legislative pieces with one another, like see if this will work in Akron. They are actually the people that I reached out to when we started talking about RIP medical debt. And I called them and I said, can I see your plan? So we can look at it and see what your plan looks like. So there's no need to go and reinvent the wheel. The wheel is already there. It's about us just picking up and running with it. But that comes with having those relationships there. So I'm not worried about people in Akron moving to Cleveland at all. I'm just not worried about that. But there has to be a relationship there and intent that we can both benefit financially uh, from our resources. Great. Don. So um, Duncan, you and I uh, have ridden the bus together. And you are actually one of only a couple of uh, Akron City Council people who have taken me up on coming and riding the bus with me and, and talking to people and, and seeing how that works. 
Um, and I know one of the things, that I, I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot here. <laughs> one of the things that you and I talked about is uh, you grew up riding the bus, um, but when it comes to making uh, transit more vibrant so that we can have a more successful city, because in my opinion, one doesn't work without the right. other. Uh, right. The city of Akron itself does not invest in public transit. Would that be part of your administration going forward? Would that be something that, that you think is important for the city? So the question is related to the value of transit and specifically uh, under your administration, would the city of Akron be investing in transit to help connect our residents to work and opportunities? Absolutely, for sure. I mean, that's that's the easy one for me. That's just like, <laughs> 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 so I, I would t I'm going to unpack a little bit about our, our, our segment. So uh, Don and I, uh, we've been, uh, uh, we've started these uh, finding the hidden gems across the city of Akron and uh and how easy it is to get on the bus to get there so we call it get on the bus literally we go like this so get these on are the like bus. uh <laughs> podcast segments yeah or so we we actually could probably like have okay. a really good show together because okay. we're just we just yin and yang each other pretty well and so what we were able to do was to show just how easy it is to get on the metro transit and get across the city how to get on a bus and go to another place it's very easy and so one of the commitments that I will make with our administration, at least once a month, you need to take the bus to work. Hmm. You need to take the bus to work, leave your car there, let's cut down on the emissions, leave your car parked at home and just jump on the bus. It's that easy. I was telling Don that when, when I went to Central Howard, we were always late for school because we had this one bus, that's why I like the new plan where they have the loop arounds that are sooner, the bus will get there sooner because we had one bus that came to the corner of 7th and Milton and we would all be sitting, we all knew we were gonna be late for school. There was no way we weren't gonna be late for school. And so we would get on the bus, but we would have to cut through the University of Akron to get to Central Howard. So we're running. Every day we were running. We knew we were gonna be late, but we still did this every day, thinking we weren't gonna be late. But because of that, when they came over to the city council and presented us with the new plan to talk about their new loop system and how um, frequent it would be now, I was like, man, why did this happen when we were in Central? Mm -hmm. Probably when it had all those tardies. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, you definitely have my commitment to that for sure. And, and we will make it a requirement that they get on the bus at least once a month. I, I'm sure most of them will with no problem, unless they want to <laughs> ride their bike. But we got to make sure we pave our streets right before they get on their bikes, right? Right, right, <laughs> right. good experience. Other questions? Well, we're close to our end of our time here, so uh, I want to give you a chance to sort of uh, any final thoughts uh, before we close up here as you think about this pursuit of the mayor's office. Right. So first of all, thank you. I oh, appreciate welcome. you, and I appreciate the work that we've been able to do um, through the chamber with helping people find jobs, uh, livable wage jobs at mm -hmm. that, good paying jobs. And, uh, and thanking you all for taking the time to listen um, to our plan and our platform for this community. And I always say our plan, because it's not just me, it's we and us doing this work. I could not do this work by myself, nor will I try to. I will not, I will make sure that I have a transition team in place that looks like this room so we can move the city forward in the right direction. So I do hope that on May 2nd, that you and your families will consider me and our team for moving Akron forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Absolutely.